Energies space. For good five years, I was leading the open source uh, business for IBM India in various capacities. And for the past two years and a half, I have focused on uh, open standards issues within the country. Uh, I've been addressing various vertical industry domain standards as well as uh, cross-industry standards. And within this, I work very closely with industry bodies, with the government, with academia, the consortiums, etc., to drive the uh, standards policy through. Uh, what I wanted to share with you today through my slides was uh, uh, IBM's standards principles that we've come out with. It's a new standards policy which we announced on September 23rd, <coughs> which, uh, uh, which has its experiences based in IBM's uh, long interactions uh, over a long period of time uh, with various standards development organizations. Uh, we are interacting, we are participating in hundreds of standard development organizations uh, internationally. And uh, we've had ups and downs. We've uh, experienced a lot of uh, uh, issues, something similar to what happened over the last year and a half. Uh, today, I'm not going to dwell into what happened uh, during the DIS 29500 uh, issues. But I'm going to share with you what are IBM's learnings from that and how we are uh, using those learnings to come out with our own standards policy. Uh, this policy, uh, which was announced on September 23rd, is essentially made up of a few principles uh, which IBM hereafter shall be following whenever we are participating in any SDO going forward. Uh, the way this policy got evolved, we, it, it was again uh, developed in an uh, open collaborative fashion. We invited uh, about 70 plus individuals uh, from various segments. Uh, they were from academia, from uh, some people from the industry, technologists, people from the open source community. And we invited them to contribute uh, in a, in a wiki-like discussion uh, towards what should IBM's uh, uh, standards policy be. We had uh, multiple feedbacks coming in, some extremely radical, uh, some very, very conservative. And at the end of it, uh, what evolved was uh, based on the fundamentals of advancing technologies, uh, collaborative uh, development of standards, uh, standards which are, uh, uh, which, are, which, are, which are based on standard policies across SDOs. Uh, so just, just to share with you, uh, one of the policy items was uh, IBM would be making a a decision when we are participating in any SDO on how should we be starting our contribution there and what would, uh, what would cause the end of that participation of IBM in that standards uh, development organization. So within this policy, uh, the effort would be to work very closely with the SDO to make all efforts possible uh, to ensure that the development within the SDO is, is done in a transparent, a collaborative, participative, open manner to the extent possible. And it's only under dire consequences, uh, the dire circumstances when, when nothing else works would, would IBM uh, take a decision on uh, not going ahead with that SDO. Uh, it's probably not the first time that we are announcing this. We've had an experience before. We are, I, I will not name the organization. Uh, but thankfully, what we found was that uh, SDOs do understand and appreciate uh, the participation of, uh, of industry, IBM being one of them. And they do, uh, uh, they do mend their ways, so to say, if, if things are not going uh, the way an SDO should ideally be uh, participating in. The, other issue uh, which was uh, a part of IBM's policy was related to IPR. Uh, and what IBM's policy says is that the uh, IPR, uh, uh, IPR policies within SDOs must be as simplistic as possible and should be as standard across SDOs to the extent possible. Uh, 
so that the implementation of those standards uh, becomes easier, uh, both for the end consumer as well as for the industry. The, uh, the third policy which uh, IBM has been focusing on is uh, to facilitate the engagement of emerging economies, uh, only uh, develop an, uh, a standard in, in silo, but ensure that emerging economies are participating in their development. Uh, also encourage the uh, engagement of those countries or individuals or organizations who at some point of time would be making use of those standards. So they have to be a contributor to that entire SDO uh, standards development organization's activities to ensure that the standard which emerges is truly global uh, in, its, in its behavior and personality. So these are some of the, uh, some of the learnings which we had, uh, which I wanted to share with, with, with all of you today. Uh, we are going to uh, ensure that going forward our, our principles, our policies are well known uh, both to the external community as well as to uh, IBM technologists, uh, participants, evangelists who are participating in these uh, standard development organizations. And this will ensure that, uh, at least from IBM's perspective, we'll, we'll make all efforts to ensure uh, that an SDO uh, activity is as participative and as collaborative and as open and as transparent as possible. That's all from my side. Thanks. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, Ashish. Um, I think we have questions at a time. Um, I think there should be mics available. Um, I think um, what we've had is input from a government perspective, a NGO perspective, and finally now a business perspective. I think IBM uh, is probably one of many companies that will be developing positions around uh, open standards and there is the realization that uh, we need to empower countries that are emerging, developing, however you want to uh, label them, uh, because of their particular uh, lack of resources, expertise and uh, other uh, issues that make them more vulnerable and don't allow them to fully participate um, in these processes. Um, so if there's um, any questions, We've got some questions. If we could get some mics, we'll take three at a time. I think we can get the lights on as well. Yes. Sorry? Lights. Uh, and if you could have the lights, please. Uh, if you could just identify yourself and ask your question. Hello. Uh, question of limiting country, uh, one uh, corporation, one world. Okay, how uh, that will really be put into practice? Because uh, it is not as though Microsoft actually has a vote. It influences all these different countries into voting for it, right? So. Uh, how do you, there's no way that you can ensure that uh, that uh, various corporations which have that kind of uh, pull don't get into these national uh, standardization processes. So I have rather a comment than a question. My name is Shadi Abuzara. I work for the uh, World Wide Web Consortium. And I wanted to underline some of the comments that Bob was making and actually also react to the question just raised. Um, I, I wanted to underline some of what Bob said about the importance of having um, low entry, and, and so I wanted to mention as another best practice besides OASIS that W3C also supports the remote participation, um, a transparent process which is available online. Um, we also implement the one vote per um, organization uh, per member, and that's consistent regardless how big or how small the member is. I think that's a very important feature. We have a consistent IPR policy, which is, I think is fairly unique, uh, even though I'm not a policy person. Uh, Royalty-free standards, as many m might know, and what's especially important for me as an Egyptian <laughs> is uh, that there's also a special program that we have for developing countries um, to, to facilitate the participation of as many people as possible. So I just wanted to mention that as, as one of the other examples that um, people may want to look at as well. Uh, my name is Jim Miller. I'm currently with Microsoft. Oddly enough, I used to be with the World Wide Web Consortium. And I had, uh, I guess, uh, a question and, a, and an explanation. Uh, I think the first speaker had made a suggestion that um, before entering into the standardization process, uh, 
you list the patents that might be covered. Uh, this may seem odd to you, but Microsoft actually very carefully evaluated that. I was, I was in charge of the standardization of the common language runtime. Um, we decided that we'd rather have the policy that said simply anything that's covered because the patent portfolio of Microsoft grows fairly rapidly. So if we had given the list at the beginning of the standardization process, we would have accidentally added additional patents later that wouldn't have been covered. So we actually see it as a, an, an enabler for the community because it simply says, don't worry about what the patent is. You really don't need to worry about any of the patents. They are all covered regardless as long as they're entailed by the, uh, the standards. We actually think that's a much better way to go than to ask for an explicit list. Um, the, well, well, let me leave it at that. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll answer those three first and then we'll take you next, if you don't mind. Um, shall we, uh, Bob, I think it's mostly, mostly. I think the first question was, was how can this sort of one corporation, one vote um, be implemented? Um, it was interesting to, to, to hear that that, in fact, is the policy that's currently being implemented by W3C. I think there's, there's, there's sort of structural reasons why it's perhaps easier to implement this through W3C than it is implementing it um, in, in an organization like the ISO. Um, because an organization like the ISO has this sort of uh, national body constitution. Um, and for that reason, it's more difficult for the ISO to prescribe what national bodies or who national bodies um, can and should send. Um, but when you have the, a net result, when you have a net result that um, you've got a clear large number of countries whose national position is being represented by um, uh, full-time employees of not just one company, of, of, of um, a number of private, private entities, then what you end up with is this sort of international uh, stage, if you like, of national bodies effectively being used as a, as a, as a battleground for um, uh, private organizations to go at one another. Um, it's not an easy thing to implement, but I, I, th I, I think that anyone who, who attends a meeting at the ISO gives usually not just their, their national body affiliation, but also um, affiliation of, of um, who they happen to, they happen to work for. Um, I don't think it solves the problem completely because the fact that, a, that, a, that a, a corporation doesn't send a direct employee doesn't mean that there are, are, are sort of downstream um, influences that can be made. But I think it would be an improvement. But certain, I don't see it as, as, as a solution in itself to the standardization by corporation. But I think, it, I think there are best practices perhaps for the W3C to learn from. But I also understand that W3C is a very differently constituted organization. Um, and perhaps the, the very model of national body driven organization like ISO is itself an unworkable model. And I think that's not a, an unreasonable conclusion to draw. Um, in response to the, to the issue of whether it's appropriate to submit a completed list of patents rather than um, a general disclosure. I think the concern that we have, we had a number of concerns, and, and it's sort of a little bit embarrassing in the end because we asked one particular corporation which we knew had a number of patents registered in the South African office, um, could they disclose whatever patents they had? And we have it in the minutes that corporations said they actually didn't have any. Um, at a later stage, some months later, when we pointed out to them the list that we found ourselves, they said, well, well, no, in fact, you do. At that point, they fell back to the position, well, there are covenants, there are, there are, there's, a, there's, a, there's a number of things. IBM has some kind of a, a, a covenant agreement thing, Sun has, Microsoft have. The problem is all of these things are, are pretty untested. We've got a patent law which is, which is pretty substantive. Um, we don't have a kind of a promise act <laughs> or a covenant act. So uh, they don't hold the same kind of legal weight. Now, on the question of, of the fact that there are, there are obviously patents in the, in the process all the time, um, I think a number of things. I mean, first of all, once 
once, a, once work has begun within a committee, I assume at that point that um, uh, any patent application would be obscured by the prior art then that's been discovered. Um, but, yeah, I, I think in order to try to understand whether, whether implementing a standard is going to, be, going to be affected by a patent or not, one really needs to see where, where the patents which are there. Uh, simply having, having a, a blanket promise is both not helpful in terms of disclosure and it's also, um, I think, legally less firm uh, than uh, description of particular patents in question. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Um, I, I think it would be particularly interesting to see what would happen if uh, Microsoft was, for example, to sell that part of its business that it's made its promise on to another entity who hasn't promised anything. Um, so, you know, that might be an interesting um, question as well. Um, I think uh, we can take more questions. Hi, thank you. Steve Delbianco with NetChoice, and it's just a point of, of protocol as someone who's been involved in every IGF and ICANN meeting f for three years. And in yesterday's main session, we heard a lot of uh, pushback when somebody actually mentioned the name of a few countries in a way that was disparaging. But what I heard today here, I think, demeans the institution of the IGF and undermines the credibility of the panel. One of your panelists actually insulted the countries and people of, of every nation that voted differently than he wanted them to on the question of that ISO standard. You said that those nations are more poor, the poorest nations, and then you claim they were more corrupt. And it's just inappropriate. You don't have to go to that level if you simply disagree with how they voted. And let's try to keep, let's try to keep it on a higher level, or I really fear we, we, risk, we risk the credibility of a conversation like we're trying to have in a workshop like this. Thank you. Okay. Um, we've got one right there at the back, or two at the back. Yeah, uh, Tiro's DCOS session, which I think is significant, and I'm, I'm glad to see an IBM person on the panel on this. Um, IBM has done a very good job of making uh, a big stress for open standards. Um, I personally have seen that the push for open standards is in spaces where it benefits your business, and this fits in with Robert's points. I guess what I'm asking, and you may not be able to say this, but I would look forward to the days when IBM actually puts protocols that they use in their mainframe space that they've actually sued people for, for um, reverse engineering. Those need to be move in, moved into the uh, open standard space, and I, and I would urge IBM to not just move open standards where it's beneficial to your bottom line, but try to do things that can help developing countries move their technology uh, away from strictly from mainframes. So, and I'd, I'd love to hear if IBM is planning to do that. Uh, we'll take one more quick. Mark Blaskin, also from ACT. I just had a, another, uh, after hearing uh, Bob say something earlier, uh, it got me thinking that one of the I think we can all agree that creating a, a more transparent and uh, more accessible set of standards bot, bot bodies is be better for everyone. But the more I think about it, the more I realize that some of the efforts out there to mandate the use of open standards, to lobby for mandates across the world, is kind of counterproductive to that, to that end goal because the same kind of battles that you saw over OpenXML are just going to become more and more of a focus. The, the, these, you're gonna turn standards bot bodies even more into battlegrounds than they are already today. And it's gonna be much more di difficult to actually get the kind of transparency, to get the kind of uh, collaboration that we all want out of standards bodies. Um, thank you. Um, I think we'll just respond to this round of questions, but if I could just ask the panel just to bear in mind the topic is um, comment. Uh, no, just to say that um, I wasn't um, a participant in the pre previous IGFs, and I didn't know this uh, pro about this protocol, so I apologize if I've broken uh, the protocol. But uh, I think I'd also like to remind uh, the gentleman who raised this concern that 70% of the population of the country I come from uh, employed in the informal sector, which is responsible for most of the employment in the country that I come from, uh, 
spend less than 50 cents a day, and uh, we are, thanks to the current configuration of the IPR regime, we are expected to pay rents for IPR when we buy medicine, when we buy DVDs, when we buy software, when we use standards, and uh, constantly there are reports from the US, like the special 301, which calls us pirates and criminals, and 95% of our country is supposed, uh, computer users in our country is supposed to be pirates and criminals. So I think there are a lot of insults being traded constantly, and uh, calling my, my country poor or, or uh, corrupt, uh, I don't think uh, that's a very different type of insult. Uh, but I would still uh, take your point very graciously and apologize for breaking the IGF protocol. Um, I, I don't think I'll take any more comments on that. I think uh, a lot of us on this panel are very new to the IGF, uh, haven't been orientated, uh, and maybe not uh, aware of all these sensitivities uh, around the, the discussions. But I think um, the discussion around standards reform is still very important. Um, the, to the gentleman from the ATC, um, I take your questions. I think they're very important questions. but. I think they're more around open standards than standards bodies reform. So I, I, I think, you know, just to take this discussion forward, we might want to take some more questions specifically around standards bodies reform. I see a hand here. Um, the ISO level is, in fact, the fast track process and not other processes at ISO. I don't actually know the other processes at ISO, but that one has the for my part, I'll, I'll be, I hope I'm not breaking protocol here, but I find it bizarre uh, property that regardless of the length or complexity of the standard that's submitted through fast track, it's a fixed amount of time to respond. And in the case of both of those standards, they're extremely long, extremely complicated, and ISO's process for disseminating it to the committees that need to make the, uh, the actual analysis took six months out of a not permitted to be longer than one year period. So the net result was that the people who actually could look, I, I agree with the statements, for example, that in most of the national bodies don't have the technical expertise to respond anyway. That's a separate problem. For the ones that did, there was six full months before ISO was able to get it to them in an official manner and before they were officially allowed to deliberate. Now, we, we tried in those cases to get the material to them in advance, so they actually had it, but officially they weren't allowed to, to begin deliberations. They then had run six months out of a one-year clock and found themselves with six months to analyze a thousand-page document. Um, it, it seems to me there's a piece of, of place where I would love to see some reform. I think the, the fast track is a good idea. I have no problem with it. It basically says you can take a previously analyzed, carefully worked specification that's already been through the standards process elsewhere and make it adopted internationally by a faster mechanism. But the particular details of that mechanism seem odd. Okay. Maybe I didn't understand that question pro or, or the, the statement, but I yeah, no, I heard but that. But the, time, the timelines that are permitted, it, it's a month for every 100 pages, you get a very different story. Than um, we have a hand there. Hi, Karin Bissana from the Shuttleworth Foundation in South Africa. So we've had some suggestions from the panel about where do you begin? Is it at country level or at, at ISO level? Do you try and get the standards bodies together? Are there any kind of practical suggestions around that for if, uh, if reform was to happen? Thanks. Standards-based products, uh, the mandating of adoption of standards-based products has, has been suggested. Um, by some of the panelists. Uh, are, are the standards bodies themselves, um, what is the role of standards bodies, national standards bodies on, 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 uh, on the adoption cycles or adoption issues? Is there, uh, is there something going on? Or I, I don't understand the standards process that much, but from the speakers, what I understood was that once uh, once a standard is created, uh, trying to mandate it is not good. Um, what is the uh, can can panel enlighten me on um, 
what is the role of standards bodies in adoption of standards within the country? Okay, we might, we might have to take that one offline. Uh, okay. since